And good morning, everyone. Good morning. It's good to see you as we gather together to worship the Lord. And a special welcome to those visiting with us this morning. You're very welcome as we gather in the meeting house here in Tober Quay. By way of announcement, little flyers will be in both porches there for Port Stewart Convention. Um, the 6th to 12th of July, strength and weakness is the theme of those meetings. 6th to 12th of July over at the Port Stewart Convention Centre. Uh, and those little cards are there in the porch tables, uh, reminders for that. This afternoon at 3, the uh, prayer meeting, prayer and planning for TCM, the children, Toberkey Children's Meetings in the Minor Hall here. Uh, that's at 3 o'clock this afternoon. Wednesday, the midweek meeting at 8 in the Minor Hall. And then Thursday, Friday and Saturday of this week, the General Assembly of the Presbyterian Church. And the format's different this year, but from Thursday morning onwards, if you check the Presbyterian Church in Ireland website, most of the, virtually all of the, the proceedings are live streamed, so you can avail of that or join in and connect with that if you so wish. There are only one or two sessions probably in private that won't be live streamed, but Thursday morning, it used to be the Monday night was the opening night, now Thursday morning, uh, Sam Mooney will open proceedings, and he'll moderate a fair part of this year's assembly, so that's a change and Richard Murray then will be installed on Friday afternoon. So the, the timetable is all on the PCI website for that, uh, finishing on the Saturday afternoon. Friday of this week, uh, 6.30, the, the final night of the Girls Association for, for this term. So uh, thanks to those that have helped with that uh, and for parents and uh, those that have encouraged the, the, the girls along to that and great to see girls gathering from the area on those Friday nights for those meetings. So thanks to all who have been involved with that. This is the final night for this term, uh, 6.30 to 8 in Tober Key this week here in the halls here. And then Wednesday week, not this Wednesday, but Wednesday the 26th, Thursday the 27th, Friday the 28th, the children's meetings, uh, the Bible Club from, from 7 to 8.30 in the evenings here. Uh, for those age four and upwards, the little flyers are available for that, and, and uh, digitally they're available if you want to forward them on to others. But remember that outreach in your prayer and spread the word in regard to the, the children's meetings, the 26th, the 28th, 7 to 8.30, 7 in the evening to 8.30. <clears throat> and then for those secondary school age, for youth fellowship age really, uh, a beach party organized by Root Presbytery, the Root Presbytery Youth uh, so that's uh, Saturday the 29th of June and uh, it's free arri uh, uh, arrival at once from 1 to 5 in the afternoon. It's free unless they are able to organise uh, coaching or teaching regarding surfing and there'll be a, a charge for that but that's not confirmed yet. Other events are, are organised, the barbecue and everything else in the game. So that's for those uh, youth Fellowship Age, the, the, the end of June, the last Saturday in June, uh, at the East Strand in Port Rush, the beach in Port Rush, the East Strand. And then one more, Cornhill, Belfast, and Cornhill uh, as an organisation in the UK, organise, uh, uh, teaching uh, and helping people to teach the Word of God. So it's, it's a, a training organisation, a bit like a Bible school. Mir Casement, one of our ministers, heads it up. It's an interdenominational work. There are Baptist Church of Ireland ministers or, or, or teachers involved in it as well. Uh, their normal pattern is a two-year course where people study uh, and study doctrine and study uh, in, in, in the scriptures and, and, and all the different uh, types of literature that is in the scriptures and how to open that up and to present a talk to others. So it's preparing people to handle the word uh, and normal patterns a two-year course where they're in a placement in a church part-time and at, at, at Cornhill part-time and it's a very very useful training it, it, it's held in Kirkpatrick Church Halls in Belfast and the Newton Arch Road, the Upper Newton Arch Road. So they, they, they're now offering something on a Monday uh, for those that maybe don't think they're going to end up in the mission field or in ministry in one denomination or another uh, they're offering a one day a week uh, Monday course for those interested just in, in being taught how to handle the scriptures aright and how to, to open it up, whether for their own studies or for ho holding uh, conversation with others or taking talks at, at youth and children's events, whatever. Uh, so that, that's Monday. So if you want more information on any of that, let me know and I'll forward you details of Cornhill uh, and the training that, that they offer. As part of today's service, uh, 
Micah Campbell be baptized, the infant son of Mark and Catherine baptizing on his parents' profession of faith. And so we welcome those from the Campbell family and the Shields family that are with us here today. You're very welcome as we gather to worship the Lord. Our call to worship comes from 1 John 3. See or behold what kind of love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. And by this we know love, that Jesus laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. Behold, see what manner of love God the Father has lavished upon us, that we can be called the children of God, adopted into his family. How precious is the mighty love of God. We're going to sing God's praise, two hymns at the start of our service, Come People of the Risen King, and then Jesus, the very thought of you. Let us worship God. We'll stand to sing.
Let's come to God in prayer. Let us unite our hearts. Let us pray. Our dear Father in heaven, how we thank you this day for the good news of the gospel of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus. Oh, dear Father, how great is your love for us, that you spared not your only begotten for us and our salvation. And Father, we thank you that you adopt us into your family through faith in Jesus, and we're able to cry, Abba, Father. We're able to call you our, our dear Father in heaven and to know your fatherly love. And Father, as we bow in your presence this day, Lord, we're mindful of those who are feeling their frailty as fathers or grandfathers and wondering how to care for others and to bring them up. And we all feel our brokenness and our weakness and our frailty. And we look to you. We pray for those who are missing earthly fathers and feeling the pain of loss. For those fathers who are missing children and feeling the pain of heartache and loss. And Father, we bow in your presence and we pray for your comfort and your peace and your strength and that hope that you put within us, that hope that is everlasting of a glorious resurrection and a great reunion for the redeemed of the Lord. And we look unto you, our Lord and our God. You're the God of all comfort and you're the God of all hope and how we praise your holy name this day. And we're to come and rejoice because our Jesus has risen from the grave, having paid the debt we owe. And we're people of a risen King, a King who's triumphed over all our enemies, who has defeated Satan and sin and death, and who has opened up the door of heaven for us. We thank you, Lord, for your mighty love, your redeeming love. Thank you for brothers and sisters in Jesus we meet with as we gather around your word. Thank you for the ministry of God, the Holy Spirit, in our midst and in our lives, turning hearts toward heaven, turning our eyes onto Jesus, the Lamb of God. And so we pray for that ministry of your Holy Spirit this day. Lord, grant to each one here this day that gift of faith, that gift of repentance unto life, that realization of how great is your love and your mercy, for you're slow to anger and rich in love. You are God, and you delight to be merciful. Oh, Lord, make us more like you. Make us a people who delight to be merciful to others around about us. Forgive us, Lord, when we're demanding the pound of flesh of others. Forgive us, Lord, when we're slow to forgive as you call us to do. You call us to forgive as we have been forgiven. Lord, empower us by your grace this day to live out our faith, in the light of your love. Draw near to us in your mercy, feed us with your word, guide us in your truth. We thank you, Lord, that you speak through your word and through these sacraments that you've given to us. And today, as we think of the sacrament of baptism, we thank you for the wonder of it and the meaning of it. And we thank you, Lord, for all that you accomplish in and through it. And we thank you that it speaks to us of your mighty grace in Jesus. So fix our eyes on your precious Son. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as I mentioned earlier, as part of our service of worship, the sacrament of baptism being administered to little Micah this morning on the profession of his parents' faith in Jesus. And why we baptize the infants of believers and not all traditions do, as you well know, and because of the debate and the divisions over baptism, some traditions don't baptize at all. They, they set aside the sacraments because they think they're divisive. So the Quakers, the Society of Friends, the Salvation Army, some that don't, don't administer baptism. But that's not an option because Jesus instituted this sacrament along with the Lord's Supper. So it's not an option to set it aside. We'll agree to disagree with those of different views, but baptism is God's design. It's God's sacrament. Jesus issued the command to make disciples and baptize. To make disciples and baptize in the name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's the apostolic practice, as we read in the scriptures of the New Testament. 
Indeed, I believe it's the apostolic practice not only to baptize adults in the profession of their faith, but I believe the apostles baptized the children of believing parents. Otherwise, I wouldn't be baptizing any children. Acts 16, we'll look at it another day, but in Acts 16, when the Philippian jailer was converted and came to know Christ and his great salvation, he and his household were baptized because he had come to believe. Now, some translations don't bring out that emphasis that it's because he had come to believe, but that's what the original says, because he had come to believe, he and his household were baptized. The Old Testament covenant sign is given to children of believers. Indeed, it's what marks a distinction. You see, the Judaism or Jews or the Hebrews of old are not the only people to circumcise and to practice that right, but they're the ones that actually bring little infants for circumcision. Others, it's a, a rite of passage at a certain age in other religions and customs. But these little children, before they're able to profess faith, are given the sign of salvation that is by grace through faith. They're given the sign of salvation even before they're able to make a profession of faith. Why? Because they're children of believing parents. It's God's covenant sign. And God has so designed that that sign be given to your children. You see, it's a sign for Christian parents or a Christian parent that God is for you and with you in the bringing up of your children. That you're not doing it alone in your own strength. It's not about how well you perform as parents bringing up these children. It's about pointing them to the grace of Almighty God and Jesus Christ from their earliest days and telling them when you were a little one before you could even understand or express faith, God gave you the sign of his salvation and that sign is calling you even now to trust in Christ and to come to Christ, to believe in him and to repent of your sins. Acts 2, 38 and 39, the day of Pentecost, the apostle Peter, full of the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit having been poured out upon the apostles, upon the disciples, and the message of the gospel is going forth, and Peter gets up to preach, and, and he, he tells people that what they have done in crucifying Jesus. He tells these, these Jews gathered from all the nations around the earth and the, and the day of Pentecost, they're there. And they're now hearing in their own language because the Spirit's at work. And, and, and he tells them of what they've done. And they wonder now, what, what do we do now knowing that we have crucified the Lord of life? What do we do now? And Peter says to them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. When we baptize in the triune name, we're baptizing in the name of Jesus Christ. And Jesus tells us to baptize in the name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We come to that in a minute. For the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children, and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. The promise, the covenant, promise and covenant are interchangeable. The promise is still for you and your children. It would seem strange in all the shadows of the Old Testament when the promise was for the believer and their children that these promises would change in the new covenant that is fuller. And so it's explicitly stated in Acts 2, the promise remains for you and your children and to those afar off whom the Lord our God will call for all that the Lord will gather to himself. The promise, the promise, the covenant. In 1 Corinthians 7, 14, and in the context of marriage, the Apostle Paul writes to the church there and describing the children of, of one believing parent, never mind two, describes these children growing up in a Christian home as holy, as holy. So while our children as Christians, our children are not automatically born again of the Spirit of God because there are children, they're automatically born with a sinful nature because there are children. Yet, for Christian parents, these children are not pagan children. They're holy. They're in a very privileged place growing up with the, 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 the blessings of God's covenant. They're in a very privileged place. And with privilege comes great responsibility. But they're described as holy. They're special to the Lord. And so we tell them of the Lord's great mercy and love. Early in life, we tell them of their need of Jesus as their saviour. 
Baptism, Christian baptism, whether it's of an adult or a child, speaks of the outpouring of God the Holy Spirit. So when water is poured upon a little one or an adult, it's speaking of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, the need of a new birth and the need of a work of God for salvation. Only God can save. Baptism with clean water, and it is clean water always in the scriptures that's being used. If you were to jump into the River Jordan today, I don't know how clean that would be if you've ever seen it up close. But it speaks of cleansing through the sprinkled blood of Jesus. It speaks of cleansing. So water speaks of the outpouring of the Spirit. It speaks of cleansing by the sprinkled blood of Christ. It's it's Christ's blood that cleanses us from sin. And baptism speaks of, of a name. We're not giving Micah James names. He has been well named. Precious names that speak of the Lord and his great love and salvation. But baptism speaks of the name of God. Coming into the family of God, the church, the visible church, coming into the visible church, longing that in due course these little ones will profess their faith in Jesus for themselves. In Matthew 28, 18 to 20, our Lord Jesus said, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always to the very end of the age. And so Christian parents and, and bringing up their little ones are seeking to disciple them, seeking to have them follow after Christ as the parents are following after Christ, making disciples of these little ones in baptism in the name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and explaining to them what this baptism means as they well, explaining to them all about Jesus. It's just my understanding as I look on at people from different traditions and with different views of baptism and those that maybe think we shouldn't baptize children. In reality, Christian parents, regardless of their view on this, seek to disciple their children, and so they should. Christian parents teach their children to pray the Lord's Prayer from their earliest days. They seek to disciple little ones, to bring them up in the faith. And so baptism is speaking of Christ and his great love for us. And so the order, whether baptism comes before faith in Christ, the order is not the most important thing. The wonder of the gift of faith is the precious thing, that God should grant his salvation. And so we're speaking of our helplessness, little babies being baptized, young children being baptized, speaking of our helplessness and our need of God's grace. And as water is poured out, we're praying for that outpouring of the Spirit, We're praying for that new birth that only God can bring about. We're praying for that cleansing by the blood of Jesus. We're praying God's great mercy. And so, Mark, Catherine, and the parents and grandparents here today, if little ones are following you, and early in life, little ones do follow us. Maybe a few years later, they mightn't just follow so close. If they're following you, who are you following? That's the challenge to me and to all of us. When little ones are following us, where are we leading them? So in your home day by day, continue to open up the word with them and to pray with them and to help them to pray and to pour out their hearts to God and, and, and teach, them, teach them of their brokenness. Teach little ones of their brokenness. You know, sometimes growing up in the modern world, people are teaching little ones about how great they are. Now they have great potential by God's mercy and they are precious, but teach little ones of their brokenness. Explain your own brokenness to them. Don't be afraid to say sorry to them when you make a mess of things. Make them aware that you're in need of God's grace every day. Let them see what it is to repent of sin. Let them see what it is to repent of sin and to trust in Jesus by the way we live, that we might lead little ones to Jesus, that they would come to love him just as we love him. We're going to sing the first verse of the baptismal hymn, Our Children, Lord.
Mark and Catherine in presenting Micah for baptism, are you affirming your belief in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Mm -hmm. We are. And three questions then based on, on, on the strength of the Lord. Are you trusting, in, depending on the grace of God, are you trusting in Jesus Christ alone as your Savior from sin and as Lord of your life? And are you committed to living as a follower of Jesus Christ, led and empowered by the Holy Spirit? We are. And are you willing to provide a Christian home and bring up your children in the worship and teaching of the church so that they may come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior? We are. And then to the congregation, a question to those in the congregation who know and love the Lord Jesus. And if you're able to answer positively, then say, we do. As we receive Micah into the fellowship of the church, do you promise with God's help to be faithful in prayer, spiritual nurture, Christian example and influence for him and his family? And may God give us grace to obey him and to be faithful to him. Let's pray together. Father, as we stand here making promises, we feel our weakness. And we're thankful that you're the God who keeps all your promises. And every promise of yours is yea and amen in Jesus. So, Lord, grant your spirit and your grace to help, Lord, each one of us to live lives that point others to Jesus. Continue to bless Mark and Catherine in their marriage and with their family. Lord, as water is poured out upon young Micah, Lord, we pray for that work of your Holy Spirit in his young life, that early in life he will know the wonder of the joy of your salvation, the joy of sins forgiven. Lord, grant that gift of faith to each one of us. Watch over Micah and his sister Charlotte here and continue to bless them with health and strength. And grant to the whole family circle an awareness of your nearness this day. Turn our eyes unto Jesus, that we might rejoice in the greatness of your redeeming love. This we ask in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Micah, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you evermore. We sing the ironic blessing upon Micah. <laughs> Is received into the fellowship of this congregation of Christ's holy, universal, visible church. And we commend him and his parents and his big sister Charlotte here to your love and prayers. We sing the remaining verses of the baptismal hymn.
we continue in our worship of God as we bring our tithes and offerings. And then after choir's anthem, the little ones can go to Children's Church or Crash. Thank you to the choir and to Audrey for that ministry and song in our prayers of intercession. Among others, we're going to remember the General Assembly of our denomination this, this week uh, for Sam Winnie and Richard Murray, who both been moderating different parts of, of that assembly. And that's where that title, Moderator of the General Assembly, comes from. That, that's really their, their role is to moderate or to chair those meetings. Uh, every congregation in Ireland able to send a representative elder and ministers from each congregation to go and to deliberate and to enter into debate and to vote on the matters are brought, that are brought before the assembly. And Danny's attending and representing the congregation here this year. And we're able to send under 
Birdie's representatives as well, uh, well they're not of the right to vote and, and Jonathan's going to attend this year in that regard as well. So we're thankful for them giving of their time to attend parts of the assembly. But remember that assembly in prayer, the different format, there have been changes over the last few years, but a more notable change this year, no opening night uh, as used to be. It begins now on the, the, the Thursday morning with uh, Sam Mawini leading the, the, the meeting there uh, and preaching the word and then the, the assembly begins and he will moderate. And then Richard takes over on, on Friday afternoon has that service of installation for him as moderator on the Friday afternoon. So it's a, a different for, form of Thursday uh, through into evening and Friday again into evening and Saturday th until midday or, or thereabouts. Uh, so pray God's hand upon us that there will be a, a real awareness of God leading and guiding us in the decisions that are needed to be taken as a lot of revision as opposed to how we do things in terms of the resources, in terms of ministry that, that are available to us. And continue to pray that God will raise up laborers, preachers of his word. Uh, and thank God he puts that burden and call upon lives and pray that God will raise up students for our ministry to to fill the, the, the needs and to expand into areas of this land that we have never really touched. To our shame, there are vast areas of this island that we have never really brought the witness of the gospel to. And so pray God's hand upon us as a denomination. We well, remember too that the, the witness of those serving in the mission field in countries where the door is closed so I'm not mentioning by name the people that are on my mind as we pray, but I'm sure you know of people, or I hope you know of some, who have had opportunity to enter in country, into countries where the door is closed to the gospel. There's no freedom to bring the gospel, and yet there are many who are bearing witness to Jesus and seeing the church grow. And so if you don't know of such folk, begin to learn about what God is doing in those countries where the door is supposedly closed. We come to God in prayer. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we bow in your presence and we're so thankful that we can trust in you and your dear son, Jesus. We thank you for the ministry of God, the Holy Spirit, in our lives and in our world. For apart from you, Lord, we're dead in our sin, we're lost. Yet you in your great mercy draw us to yourself. Lord, as we bow here, we're mindful of loved ones grieving this day, whose hearts are aching. We think in, in particular of Mandy Laverty and the whole family and the death of her mother suddenly just this past week. And we pray for Mandy and for Alan and for the whole family circle, Lord, just your mighty arms of comfort for Paula. And Lord, draw near to them. Encourage and help them to come to terms with the suddenness and the shock of it all and grant them just an awareness of you carrying them through these days and weeks that lie ahead. Be their comfort and their strength, Lord, for we need you. And for others that are grieving, that are dear to us and are in our neighbourhood here, Father, we pray that your great comfort would abound and that grieving hearts would know what it is to, to look to you and to cast their burdens upon you and to know the God who wipes away our tears and who gathers us in his mighty arms of love. Oh Lord, thank you for the greatness of your comfort. How precious it is to be able to tell others that we have found comfort in the living God. And we pray, Lord, that they too would just run to your arms of love. Father, as our eyes are focused on the sacrament of baptism today, we thank you for little Micah's life and the meaning of his names, Micah James, and we Pray, Father, that work of your Holy Spirit in his young life and in all our lives. And as we're gathered here, Father, we're mindful of loved ones, who, some of whom were baptized as children and others even baptized as adults. And yet today, we see no love for you. We see no concern for their souls. We see no joy in the, in the forgiveness of sins. We see no evidence of new birth. And Lord, we bring them to you, we name them to you, Lord, and we ask, O oh God, that you would help us even to remind them of your great promise of mercy and grace to them in their baptism. And remind them, Lord, of their utter need of Jesus, and that we would be able to explain to them, Lord, our brokenness and our sinfulness, 
and how great is our Saviour, our Lord Jesus, that we'd be able to open up conversations with family members and loved ones and friends that we've never really had a conversation with about the things eternal. So, Lord, grant us those opportunities. May they come even asking the questions. Bring them to their senses, Lord, and grant them an urgency to be right with you. Oh, that they would come to know the reality of what their baptism spoke of. That they would come to know the salvation of Almighty God. That we acknowledge this day that all our efforts and all our wisdom and all our giving them this, that and the other cannot save them. Lord, it is only you who saves and you save to the uttermost all who come to you. So we bring to your loved ones, Lord, as we name them in our hearts and we pray, draw them to yourself. Oh, may they hear that call of the gospel, Lord, they've heard the gospel maybe many a time. But long we, Lord, we long that they will be gripped by your voice, that they would realize the depths of your love for them, that your mercy would lead them to repentance and to rest in the finished work of Jesus. Father, build your church, we pray. Grant to this denomination of which we are part, your wisdom and your help and your guidance in the meetings of the week that lie ahead. Grant your spirit to watch over us and to prompt us and to guide us and grant us ears to listen to those and the views that they're expressing and grant us wisdom to know how to interact with it and how to respond to it. And above all, Lord, may we each one want to bring it all back to your word and to be rooted in and grounded upon the word of God to do what you want us to do. May it please you to continue to use this denomination in the extension of your kingdom. Forgive us, Lord, when we've been slow to go, when we've been going over the same wee patch time after time and never really branching out into new ground, into areas where there's little gospel witness. And so, Father, grant us a, a passion for your glory and a compassion for souls. Raise up laborers in your word, Lord. Burden hearts this day. Put a call upon lives to rise up and offer themselves in your service and to prepare and train. Raise up those preachers of your word and evangelists to take the gospel. And, Father, we pray for those missionaries we know of in those countries where doors are closed, where governments don't want any gospel witness. And yet, Lord, you have brought your people in. And others have been there all along because the gospel had been there. And while people try to push it out, Lord, you will build your church. The gates of hell cannot prevail against you. And Father, we thank you for brothers and sisters Christ that you've given this great vision to, to to use the skills and enabling that they have, whether they're engineers or medics or teachers, or whether they're involved in agriculture and development work, and you've opened up the door into countries and they're there and they're living out their faith and they're speaking to others about Jesus and showing forth the love of Christ. And they're seeing people converted and growing in the grace of Jesus. And it thrills our hearts, Lord, this day to know of this mighty witness to your gospel. Oh, may you raise up more with that passion to humbly go and to serve and to even risk their lives with a concern for the souls of others and the glory of the name of Jesus. Raise up another generation for the mission field, Lord, we pray, that your good news will spread. Lord, there's so much hatred and bitterness abounding, wars and rumours of wars and people stocking up and storing much and not willing to share with others. Lord, forgive us and grant us hearts of compassion. We pray for the children's meetings, Lord, uh, in a week's time. We pray, Lord, your hand upon the preparations for these meetings. We pray, O oh God, that you'll gather young lives in, that, that your spirit will strive with these young lives, speak into their hearts, Lord. Save souls early in life to the praise of your wonderful name. All these things, Lord, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have your Bibles there, turn to 1 Corinthians 12. And we'll read verses 20 to 21. 
after Acts and Romans, we come to Corinthians and 1 Corinthians 12. We continue our studies here in this letter of the Apostle Paul to the church in Corinth. We read of the founding of the church in Acts 18. Paul spent 18 months there. He spent a long time there. God had assured him. God had told Paul that he had many people in this great city, many people that would come to faith. In spite of all the obstacles and opposition and disappointments and gospel work, Paul was assured God had many people in this great city. A very modern city in its day, like cities that want to be modern in our day, the things that happened in Corinth were just like cities of the 21st century, really just like cities of the 21st century. It's so like that it's incredible just to think of the, the immorality and the godlessness and a church muddled up and mixed up and, and, and trying to live and reach out in the midst of it all. 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 21, or verse 20. 1 Corinthians 12, 20. As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And on those parts of the body that we think less honourable, we bestow the greater honour. And our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honour to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honoured, all rejoice together. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. Amen. As we look at 1 Corinthians 12 and these studies in, in this epistle and in this section, the ministry of God, the Holy Spirit, and the whole discussion of grace gifts, charismata, gifts of God's grace, and God gives gifts of his grace to every believer. He's still giving us these gracious gifts, enabling us to serve him. And debate might come as we study on as to what is still in the church and what's not, and what's real or genuine and what's not, and we'll maybe disagree and agree to disagree on some of those things. But very clearly last week we were looking at the whole issue of body ministry. That the whole body, the church, God through the Apostle Paul is likening the church to the human body. Different members, different parts of the body making up one body and there is one church of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we're brought in to the one church by the one Holy Spirit. The one Spirit in baptism and it's speaking of the baptism of the Spirit. And the Spirit brings us into the body. The one Holy Spirit brings us into the one church and there is but one true church and no denomination, no matter how bold they might be in their claim, no denomination can claim to be the one true church. They're denominations. And so that word Catholic, which means universal, is the whole church. It's, it's, it's not for one denomination with headquarters in Rome. The word Catholic is something that Protestants, as we said last week, ought to realize is something that we're all part of for Christ's. Catholic means universal, and I have brothers and sisters in Christ scattered around this world, and when you come into contact with them, that's precious. When you go on your holidays and your travels, one of the most precious things of all, it's even more beautiful than seeing the great sights of the world, is to meet brothers and sisters in Christ and to learn from them. And don't miss out on that in your travels. If you're traveling over summer weeks and months, don't miss out on seeking out little fellowships, whether in this island or across the water or throughout Europe or beyond, you'll be surprised just where you might discover a little fellowship and how they'll go out of their way to embrace you and to welcome you and maybe translate what's going on for you so that you can understand. And many of them put us to shame in that regard and the effort they make to welcome people in. And the, the, the whole idea of body ministry, every member, every Christian, to be actively involved in the ministry of the church. And we're not into a mindset of only one person ministering. While we said ministers are teaching elders apart to labor in the word, every elder is to be apt to teach the word, but ministers given this role or this privilege to labor in the word and to teach and to preach. Ephesians 4 reminds us that the very call of pastor teacher is to equip all the saints for works of service. 
So when the word is being rightly preached, taught, a whole church is being equipped to serve the Lord. Body ministry. But today we, we think of body health as this body ministry takes place, the great need for a healthy church. And church growth numerically is not always filled and marked by health. Indeed, some things that draw a crowd are often nothing to do with the gospel or the spirit of God at all. A crowd can can be drawn. You just need to look at sports stadiums around the world and see crowds drawn and it's nothing to do with the gospel. So a crowd does not necessarily mean that things are healthy. A, a church that's growing numerically may not mean things are healthy and, and the spiritual health and well-being of the church is of vital importance if we're to effectively fulfill our calling where God has placed us. And so in verses 21 to 27, we focus in on this body health, the health of the local church and the worldwide church. And first of all, we discover that we need one another. In the previous verses, we, we had dealt with those that, that didn't feel themselves to be part of the body. And they're reminded that even though they didn't feel themselves to be part of the body or even needed in the body, that did not mean that they weren't part of the body. They still were a vital part of the body, even though they didn't feel themselves. And they're full of their feeling of inadequacy as they looked at others and maybe the giftedness of others and, and they felt of little value and of little worth. And they, 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 they didn't see any role for them within the body, didn't feel a part of it. But don't depend on your feelings. Your feelings are fickle and mixed up and messed up, depend on the facts. And God says, when we come to Jesus Christ and put our trust in him, we're part of the body, the church. We're a member of the body by his grace. And we're precious. Oh yes, we're unworthy. We're unworthy of any good thing from God. But God places a worth and a value in our lives like no one else ever will. The wonder of the dignity that God gives to human beings made in his image, even though the image is marred by our sin, and yet this dignity and this reality that we're made in the image of God remains. And every human life is precious and has a worth and a value. God-given. God-given. And so we're to treat every life as precious and let every Christian know that their life and their ministry within the body is precious. In terms of body health, Verse 21 here, we see that we need one another. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Hopefully the eye can see, and sees what the hand or the hands do and knows they're needed in the body. You only need to get a little paper cut on your finger and discover that the hand's not able to do things and, and you feel the lack of it and, and, and just the, the difficulty in doing anything. Never mind if you break a bone in your hand or your wrist or your arm and, and this inability for a little while and you realize how precious every little finger and every hand and every member of the body is. Indeed, humanly speaking, we often don't realize just how important the members of our body are until some of them aren't doing what they used to do. Or maybe they never did for some of us what they were meant to do. And we feel the reality of the lack of these members and their functioning. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. The head surely ought to know that these feet are precious and what they can do and just the, we are fearfully and wonderfully made. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. Indispensable. These parts that maybe are thought to be weaker, they're indispensable in the body. They're precious and we need them. And so this realization that, Christian, you need brothers and sisters in Christ. We don't stand alone. Oftentimes, we, we come across Christians, and I suppose all of us could put ourselves in this, in this frame of mind at times, who struggle with the local church fellowship and say, it's just too difficult being part of a church, and it's made up of people, and they're all difficult. They're all just like themselves, just like me. We're all difficult at times. And, and part of a local fellowship is just difficult. And I can just walk up a mountain on a Sunday all by myself and worship God. And I don't need to be part of a fellowship. And God says, no, you need to be part. Indeed, I have made you to be part of the body of Christ. 
And yes, we can walk up a mountain and see the beauty of God's handiwork and stand in amazement, not just at the mountain, I hope, but at the God who made it all. That's what those great views are there to remind us of the greatness of God. But we need the church and we need to be part of it and using the gifts God has given us in the body, serving the Lord in the body. We need one another. And the weaker, those that appear to be the weaker parts or members of the body are indispensable. So if you be Christ today and whatever gifting God has given you and whatever callings upon your life, you're an indispensable part of the body of Christ for as long as God would have us in the scene of time. And then we go to the, the heavenly aspect of the body, waiting the great reunion of the whole body when Christ comes in glory. We need one another. We depend upon one another. And sometimes we're stubbornly independent and we don't want to depend on anyone. But God has ordained it that we are to be interdependent upon one another to show forth his grace and his love. We need one another. Secondly, we see here that we are to value one another. The, these things flow out of each other. We're to value one another. Verse 23, on, on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor. One example of less honorable, little, a little finger, this one in, in the hand, and, and, and what is it? And you maybe think if that finger wasn't there, it would hardly matter, and yet... And honor is bestowed upon it to carry rings and, and to display something that's precious. And an honor bestowed, and that which seems insignificant could be done without, and yet honor is bestowed upon it. And members of the body of the church, and maybe, maybe feeling of little worth and little value, and, let, and then the church comes and, and bestows an honor upon those members, calling them into some role or another, and treating them those that were less honourable in the eyes of many and they're, they're receiving greater honour to the praise of God's grace. So we're to value one another. The non-presentable parts are treated with greater modesty. And so we realise that, 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 that all these different parts of the body, whether internal or external, whether that which is presentable or that which we don't want to, to lay bare to anyone, these different parts of the body are all necessary and all valuable and so it is with every christian every christian in the body is to be valued now, i wonder how you think about all of that if you're christ today and you've come to know jesus as your savior do you value brothers and sisters in christ are they precious to you in the local fellowship and even into an area and beyond worldwide do you take an interest in the church do you value brothers and sisters in Christ. Just as we're to value every member of, the, of a human body, every, every, every limb, every, every part of God's great design, we value it all and marvel at it. So we are to look at every Christian and, and see them through the eyes of God's grace. Oh, when we think of grace gifts, to be able to see through the eyes of grace and to see brothers in Christ, brothers and sisters in Christ in the way God sees us. And so you might be irritated and, and frustrated with this boy in the pulpit, as I'm sure will be the case if it hasn't happened already. And you'll be saying, that boy's hard to, hard to cope with and, and I don't know just what to make of him or somebody else in the fellowship. And, and you're thinking to yourself, oh, I'll just keep them at a distance and not get too, too involved. Well, start to see this boy through the eyes of grace. Start to see one another through the eyes of God's grace to look at, upon others in the way God looks upon us, as loved by him and precious and forgiven and redeemed and a work in progress for God hasn't finished with us yet. He hasn't finished with us yet. And start to show something of the love of God to brothers and sisters in Christ. Count them as precious. Are there brothers and sisters in Christ here today and you don't even know their names and you've been sitting in a meeting house with them for years? Are there brothers and sisters in Christ and you're not just sure who they are yet? Are they valuable to you? That's a very real question. And if you don't know the names of some, don't let another week go by until you start learning. And you say, I can't learn, can't remember names. Write them down. Start praying for them. And you'll start to remember. 
and get to know them and take the opportunities to get alongside people. Every member is valuable. We are to value one another. We need one another. Thirdly, in this body of health, we are to live in unity with each other for there to be no divisions among us. The, the whole ministry of God's grace and these grace gifts are, is for the well-being of the church and the advance of the gospel to the glory of Jesus. In the same, the, the, the verse 24, the end of it, God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, that there may be no division. <laughs> if you've been in church life any length of time at all, you know that there are divisions in every local fellowship and every denomination. There are divisions in the church around the world. There are divisions. And the reality of that is painful. It's painful. And there are to be no divisions because we're all part of the, the body and a spiritually healthy fellowship will seek to overcome those divisions in the grace of the Lord. It doesn't mean we always agree on all the secondary issues that we always see eye to eye, but we know how to agree to disagree and to love one another and to care for one another. And the, the wider, what's known as the ecumenical movement, a man-made or a people-centered organization, I suppose, trying to bring a unity about by man's design and be best efforts, that is doomed to failure. And it's not something I'll be given my devotion to because it's a man-focused unity. And it tends to set aside truth. It says now we're, we're spending too much time in the doctrines of things and in the gospel. We'll just set that aside and we all just need to come together and, and say that we're Christians and we want to unite. And you can't unite without the truth of the gospel. And there is to be a biblical ecumenism. Every reformed teacher and preacher down through the years that understood the gospel would have told you that. There is to be a biblical ecumenism that flows out of the gospel. So when Jesus is lifted up in the gospel and people come to believe in him and receive him as their saviour and lord and follow after him, regardless of views on secondary issues that aren't foundational to the gospel, we agree to disagree and we're one in Christ and we're able to unite in many things in the advance of the gospel. And in local fellowships, we need that patience one with another, seeing others through the eyes of God's grace, and saying, Lord, grant me patience and love in my heart to love my brothers and sisters in Christ in something of the manner in which you love them. Grant me that love, that I would love people in something of the way you love me and you love them. And so I need the love of God shed abroad in my heart by the Holy Spirit every day. Romans 5, a wonderful portion of scripture in regard to all of this. Oh, that God would shed his love abroad, pour his Holy Spirit into our lives day by day, that we might love him and love one another. We're to live in unity. There to be no divisions. And it's the gospel that unites us. And it's the grace of God in the different gifts given to his people that brings unity and and so when you, you enter into the whole discussion about grace gifts and gifts of the Spirit, the different terms used for, for the language of 1 Corinthians 12 through to 14, if it's all about division, there's something wrong because the grace of God is turning our eyes onto Jesus and uniting us in the gospel and seeking to build up the church and to advance the kingdom. Fourthly, finally, in terms of body health today in these verses, we are to show the same care for each other and the same care to every member that's what's being brought out here we're to show that same care this this unity there are to be no divisions that the members may have the same care for one another verse 25 the same care for one another not just caring for the people that we find easy to care for but caring for the whole fellowship so there be people that maybe you don't have much in common with humanly speaking and you're to care for them. And we're to show that love. If one suffers, all suffer. In the human body, you know it. It's if your big toe's not working too well, before you know it, your knees are getting out of line, and your hips and your back and your head and the whole body's getting affected. And if one member suffers as the church body, the whole body suffers. It may not initially be noticed. That member may have been suffering and may have isolated themselves, and you didn't even realize but you're suffering a loss 
if they're not using the gifts God has given them in the fellowship of the people. And if one suffers, all suffer. Oh, that there were such a closeness in local church fellowships that when one Christian suffered, all the whole fellowship felt the reality of it. If one is honored, all rejoice. Rather than bickering and, and, and being full of envy and saying, I want the honor, I would love to have the honor that was bestowed in them, I would love that for me. When one is honored, all rejoice. Such is the love and the care that ought to be in the body of Christ. And may God grant us such a compassion for each member. Do you seek to care for brothers and sisters in Christ? And do you, do you welcome such care into your life? We can be difficult to love, can't we? We can put up the barriers and keep people at a distance even when they're trying to come and help us and care for us. And we're saying, I can do it myself. And from our earliest days, that's often the cry of little ones finding their independence and I'll do it myself. And then even in adulthood, when we know we can't do it ourselves, we're still crying, I'll do it myself. That, that ourselves alone language goes far through a whole community, doesn't it? And we need one another. And we need the care of a whole fellowship. God has so designed us. And we need to welcome the love and care of brothers and sisters in Christ into our lives. And to realize, well, that person there, you know, that's trying to help me, I don't think they really know what they're doing. And, but yet God has burdened their hearts and they're coming and they're trying to help and encourage. And I need to welcome them in and see this grace gift at work that's in their heart and lives. Body health, so that we might be effective for the glory of Jesus. May God make us fruitful in his service and grant us a health of heart and soul, not only as individuals, but as a fellowship. We're going to sing in closing, How Deep the Father's Love.
Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all evermore. Amen.